Welcome back to What Is This Weapon, everyone. I'm Jonathan, and this, I'll tell you right off the bat, is a GM-94, and I'll call it a grenade launcher, but I'll also tell you it's technically a flamethrower because its other name is LPO-97, and without uh, attempting the Russian for that, uh, LPO is, well, an incendiary weapon designation. So the, think of the, the nomenclature around this as um, GM-94 is like AR-15, and LPO-97 is like M-16 or M-4. It's the military designation in the Russian military, because this is, in fact, Russian. Um, Post-Soviet, uh, developed in 1993, hence the designation GM-94. There was a prototype GM-93, which we do not have, unsurprisingly, but we do have one of the issue examples, which we're very fortunate uh, to have here. The, the initial trend, <laughs> sort of Vietnam era, the, the M79, of course, in American service, and then actually um, ended up in, in, in other hands as well, of a standalone grenade launcher break it open, shove in a, a, a cartridge, giant <laughs> small arms cartridge, essentially, 40 millimeter grenade, of course, uh, fire that off and you can reload singly. Um, you'll be familiar with the attempts to develop something, or some of you, uh, something with more rounds on board, as it were, so you don't have to reload from a vest the whole time. Um, and so the, the uh, sort of analog to this is the China Lake pump action grenade launcher, or an interesting British prototype for something similar that we'll probably show you one day, so I don't want to talk too much about. Um, but this is, well, so, so yeah, this is essentially three rounds, pump action, I'll show you right away, put you out of your uh, anticipation. Press the catch. Ambidextrous controls on this, which I think is interesting for uh, the early 90s. Press the catch, slide it forward, and we get a big gaping gap on the bottom of the gun. You can see there. I'll show you in a bit more detail in a moment. Because um, I won't I won't try to disassemble this per se, but I can remove the barrel to show you that. Uh, and get, get a better view of the inside when we do that. So there are those ambidextrous, um, i.e. operable from either side, left or right-handed. There are the catches. Uh, there's an interlock as well. So when the safety, which is also ambidextrous on both sides, is engaged, not only can you not pull the trigger all the way through, you also cannot press the latch to disengage this. Um, you can imagine there'd be all sorts of safety concerns if you could just open up this sort of reverse pump action, which is really what it is. Uh, so there is a, a safety interlock there between the manual safety and these latches. So you open it up and if the magazine is loaded, and as you probably gather the magazine tube is on top of the gun, which is it's, it's reverse in two ways, it's reverse in terms of you pump forward and then back again to chamber around, but also the arrangement, the over and under arrangement is, is sort of back to front. Normally you'd have the magazine tube on the bottom with a pump grip around it and action bars driving a bolt. This is for a pump action shotgun, typically, of course. And then the top tube would be the barrel. Not the case with this, as you can see. Top tube is closed at the front. Bottom tube is your rifled grenade barrel. Um, 40, 43 by 30 millimeters is the, car, the sort of um, standard metric cartridge designation for, for this thing. Uh, we'll talk about the ammunition types uh, a bit later on. Uh, trigger mechanism is double action, so that's it firing off. It will do that regardless. It doesn't have to be cocked by any other mechanism. It's, it's independent. Speaking of um, controls and, and features on both sides, we have sling loops on the right side and on the left side where my finger and thumb are. For the front, we don't have the sling for this, but it fits either side. And on the back, this uh, pivot point for the stock, which I'll show you in a moment, has a sling loop on it as well. So you'd have to reverse that one to mount your sling on your other side. So for a right-hander, you'd want the sling on the left side. Sling, a sling being very important for this because these standalone launchers um, 
obviously they're not attached to the bottom of the weapon, so you need to be able to sling them somehow. And you're going to typically be armed with another weapon to defend yourself with, because this thing has limited capacity, three rounds in the magazine tube. Um, I guess you could uh, perhaps finagle another round into the breach while keeping the, the three in the tube for a total of four. I haven't tried. We don't have any rounds to try, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, let's say three rounds. So you're going to want at least a handgun. Um, footage from the current conflict in Ukraine shows um, guys carrying AK-74Ms as lo alongside this. That's not an insignificant burden. So you've got all of these grenade rounds. You've got this beast of a grenade launcher slash flamethrower. Uh, as I explained, uh, LPO designates a flamethrower. Well, not in terms of throwing flame, but in terms of projecting a round that is incendiary. That's the, the, the full explanation for that that I failed to give you at the beginning. So yeah, you, you've got uh, a lot of bulk and, and awkwardness, but it does give you some pretty devastating firepower out to some significant distance. So we have a, a rear sight here. This is sprung for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. And then the sight ladder, it's a pinch. It, this is just spring steel. So it's, it's a little bit crude on the rear sight. You pinch and slide and select your preferred range. And the digits actually span the ladder. So at the bottom, we have 25 meters, 50 meters, all the way up to 250 meters here for this aperture here. And you can see that's already quite the elevated angle. Um, this is a big, heavy projectile, so it's a bit of a rainbow trajectory like any grenade. And then the very top, there's an auxiliary notch there for 300 meters. So there's your, your maximum effective range. I believe it, it can push out further, but uh, yeah, it's intended for use out to 300 meters. Uh, we've seen it used at rather closer distances than that. Um, the stock I've mentioned, so it's shaped like this. This would be good for um, visored helmets. We see this sort of stock for that purpose, like SWAT teams or riot police or whatever. But actually the main reason I, I think is to um, allow you to place the stock at different points on your shoulder and sort of crane your neck to, to get a view through a given sight notch. Um, at no point do you get a, a cheek weld, uh, but that's the price you pay for being able to adjust the angle of fire. And as I say, it, it would, uh, this is partly intended for internal security services. So a visored helmet is, is yeah, one of the reasons for this. So to fold, fold up the buttstock, we have a couple of steps, or three steps, I suppose. One is this, so there's, um, you can always spot a, a, an intended control on a firearm, or I suppose any piece of machinery, if it has hatching or knurling or some sort of grippy surface on it. That's probably intended for someone to operate, and that's the case here. So we get in there with the thumb, press down, Little bit awkward to say the least. There we go. That unlatches the butt plate, which is now flapping around. Um, the reason that's awkward is to make very sure that this doesn't get accidentally unlatched. I'm sure of that, because uh, that would seriously affect the <laughs> ability of the user to, to use the weapon. And then we have this latch here, it's a bit more obvious. And then we pull back on that unlatches the, the buttstock. So this is a very robust, welded bit of tubular and sheet steel. We then fold the whole thing up, and you can see there where the rear sight being hinged and sprung into place comes into play. Because it squishes its own sight down. And I have to give it some welly there to make it latch in, but that is now latched in place. Obviously, it makes it very compact for, for transport. You would not want to shoot it with the stock folded. Um, you could, I guess. There is a, a buckshot, well, sorry, not a buckshot, a birdshot shotgun round for this. Um, I guess you could, you could, in a pinch, use it for, for that sort of close-in fighting. In your right mind, you would absolutely want to unfold the stock and lock it into place. Uh, apart from anything else, you can't use the sights while the stock is folded. 
but it makes it compact for stowage and for transport. And if you're running up to position, it acts as a carry handle as well. And that's the, the manufacturer makes a point of that. So that's not just an accident. Well, it sort of is an accident because I, I believe the stock's been designed for, for sort of helmeted use and for adaptive aim, aiming, as it were. They just realized that when they fold the stock up, you get a free carry handle into the bargain. So we will unfold this and notice when I do that, that the rear sight, of course, pops itself back up into firing position. You don't have to readjust the sight other than to adjust to whatever range you want. And then it's latch it in place there, latch it in place there, and you're back to using this thing either way around. So it's a bit unnatural for me, but you can put it into the left shoulder and it has the same controls on both sides and you can have the sling on both sides as well. So it's a, it's a modern, seemingly quite effective weapon it's slightly at odds with the, uh, the general trend of integrating grenade launchers into modular weapons. So, you know, assault rifle on top, um, grenade launcher on the bottom, and certainly goes ag against the brief trend of trying to create integrated weapons that are both a bullet firing weapon and a grenade firing weapon with fancy electronic controls and stuff. The OICW, for example, that, that whole idea seems to have mostly gone away. Um, which means that you get both now. You get underbarrel grenade launchers, but increasingly we are seeing standalone launchers like this. So this is perhaps ahead of the curve, but it's debatable. The standalone launchers I'm thinking of, like the M320 um, or equivalents, you either fit it to a rifle or you fit a grip stock to it and carry it as a rather lighter and less cumbersome grenade weapon and then you can carry a rifle with it. Um, this this is arguably a bit too chunky and heavy. Okay, you've got a, a dedicated grenadier in your squad, but um, if he's having to carry a rifle as well, I'm not sure that's um, ideal. But I'm not a tactician or a soldier. Oh, and we will <laughs> briefly notice that there is a quite thick rubber butt pad here with holes for compression. So as relatively low recoil as the ammunition presumably is, it still requires a very thick butt plate there to soak up the recoil of firing. And while well, we're looking at furniture, as well as two hand positions here, which I don't fully understand without access to the manual or having any experience using the thing, I assume that's deliberate. We have, a ha we have um, hand stop at the rear, but two hand stops at the front. So I'm guessing at certain ranges, you're going to find it more comfortable to use the inner position and at other ranges, probably closer to, would be my guess, you're going to use the front grip, as it were. So two grip positions. And then the pistol grip um, is only noteworthy, really, for having the logo of the KBP Instrument Design Bureau on it, because they are the designers and manufacturers of this thing. But they're based in Tula, a very famous old Russian arms making centre. Uh, see our Tula garniture on our collections website and in our uh, hunting gallery uh, back from the 18th century. Um, also known for making the AKS-74U compact Kalashnikov, uh, among other things. Uh, not the same company, although I believe this was a spin-off from the Tula arsenal um, at a certain point in history. Not, a, not an expert on that by any means. Otherwise, we have on the side, the only real markings on this thing are GM94 in Cyrillic, obviously, and a serial number uh, next to it. I'm not seeing any other markings to speak of, so let's pop it open. So it, it's a little bit reminiscent of a machine gun, belt-fed machine gun. We have buttons either side on this top cover here. Press, lift, that's your, that's your top cover there. You can see inside, and I have no rounds to show you unfortunately, but you can see, just like a pump-action shotgun, there is a quite heavily sprung 
follower and a coil spring inside that tube to, to, to hold the rounds. And they are then pushed backward, ready for uh, dropping onto the breech face. So if we open it up again, I'm going to try and show how this works. There are videos online showing this thing being operated, if you're, if you're curious. But there are channels, grooves, either side here, running full height. I don't know if you can see that, but so where my where my finger is. So the round comes back out of this magazine. Its rim is caught in these grooves, and it drops down under pressure from the top cover, essentially, onto the breech face, which if I flip the thing over, the, and the breech face is there, the little hole is the firing pin hole. Um, now, as I've only just discovered, with the, with the weapon open, whether or not the safety's on fire or not, the trigger is made safe. So that's another safety mechanism there, which is interesting. So another safety feature there, um, perhaps the most important, because if somehow, I'm always messing around or something, uh, or somehow a round got uh, onto the breech face without the barrel being slid over it and locked in place, and your firing pin was able to hit the primer, that's going to detonate. I don't know what the result of that would be. Uh, it could be anything from a loud pop and some embarrassment to some missing fingers. Um, discuss. Needless to say, the designers thought that wasn't a good idea, so the trigger is inoperable regardless of the position of the safety when the weapon's open. And what happens during firing is that the next round in the, in the sequence, as it were, as that is pushed down into place by the, um, by the top cover, pushes the fired case off at the breech face. Obviously, I'm a little hampered in demonstrating that without having the rounds. But the rounds are, they're not caseless. Um, I guess they're partially cased. So it's really just a case head with a rim that's left on the breech face after firing. You pump it forward, a round is pushed down onto the breech face, ready to be chambered, and the case head drops off. It's pushed out of the way, which I guess means that when you fired your final shot, there will be an empty case head on the breech face, and you would presumably have to remove that manually. But there might be a system that I'm missing uh, that means that when you open it up again, it always gets pumped, uh, swept off the face of the breech. It's the sort of thing that really you want inert rounds, or at least a manual, to be able to understand. But hopefully you get the gist. Now, um, another quite interesting feature, I think, uh, discovering this just by experiment, experimenting with the thing, is with the top cover open, and we press the release latch, and we slide the barrel slash pump grip forward, because it's both on this, Oop, off it pops. And that is a deliberate design feature. Um, when the top cover's down, this thing is, it cannot, cannot go forward. If it could, that'd be a massive problem. Too far forward, I should say. What that is, is a, a sort of built-in disassembly feature. And I believe that's as far as you would need to go for cleaning. You could obviously clean it on the gun, but it's a bit safer if you remove the barrel before cleaning, and probably a bit easier as well. So you could clean the breech face. Um, any other uh, fouling that happens to have built up and then you can uh, pull through the barrel very easily. So this also gives us one more marking, which is just a repetition of GM94 uh, number. And then there appears to be no number, interestingly. Um, and then 43 millimeters, just to uh, so that no one tries to shove a 30 millimeter or 25 millimeter grenade in there. So this is quite easy to reinstall. We just get these two ears, line them up with roughly that shape of the gun, on the gun. Make sure that the rails on the bottom of the barrel are lined up with the sheet metal rails on the, uh, sorry, of the magazine, are lined up with the sheet metal rails of the barrel. Slide it forward, close the top cover, and we're good to go. 
So quick word on ammunition. So that's the VGM 93 round. Um, the, that is the designation for the whole family of ammunition, VGM 93, and then it's hyphen and then a number. So we have VGM 93, um, well, tellingly, VGM 93 100, which is the, the, the first round in the list, essentially, is the thermobaric round. Uh, that's perhaps what we've seen in recent footage in Ukraine, because um, there's a, a fair old fireball coming out of this uh, grenade when it lands at, at alarmingly close range, at least for me as a, as a civilian. And that speaks to the designation again of LPO 97, because that's the sense in which this is a flamethrower. So in, in one sense, thermobaric rounds are the replacement for battlefield flamethrowers, at least um, for, for Russia at the moment. And so the, the first round, the standard issue round, as far as I know, is the thermobaric round. Um, incidentally, there is a, a, a good write-up on this system um, over at Armament, Armament Research Services, who, who I work with as well, um, that give you the sort of important information, um, a lot of which I'm, I'm repeating here. Uh, so VGM 93-200 is tear gas, so uh, that speaks to its urban sort of pacification role. Um, VGM 93-900 is high explosive fragmentation, which is what you would think of as a standard round for a grenade launcher. We have 600, which is rubber slugs, and there are various other non-lethal projectiles as well. All of these should be traveling at about 85 meters per second velocity. So relatively low velocity, much like the, the 40 millimeter uh, grenade launchers or 37 millimeter less lethal launchers, perhaps. They're, they're all in sort of 70, 80, 90 meters per second. Anything more than that for a non-lethal round is probably a bad idea. Um, these are big, heavy rounds, and they're sort of juggling with pressure and velocity to try to reduce the impact on the user's shoulder, but still get a, a, a big enough payload for whatever you need at range. Uh, in terms of issue, the initial issue in 2005 was to the RHBZ, uh, which is the uh, Radiological uh, Nuclear Chemical Unit um, of the Russian Armed Services. In 2005, the same year, they're, they're actually used by the security services in a hostage rescue. In 2012, they're procured for the 45th Detached Reconnaissance Regiments, uh, who are airborne also exported to Kazakhstan, who are used by the, uh, where it's used by the, the paramilitary police. So it's, it's seen a, a reasonable amount of adoption since the early 90s, mid 90s. Um, I assume it's still in production and will still, will continue to show up. Uh, the, only, the only other nation that comes to mind that uses a sort of heavy duty standalone grenade launcher like this would be China, um, with it, which has a sort of parallel system, it's even bigger actually. The sort of non-state actors in, in the Libyan uh, conflict in which uh, Gaddafi was, was ousted also showed up with this, which is interesting. And of course, multiple times in the 2014 invasion of Crimea, and it's being seen at the moment um, with, with a certain amount of, of frequency for, for its specific role. Obviously, you're far more likely to see rifles, machine guns, that kind of thing. But keep an eye out if you're, if you're watching the news footage and, and Twitter feeds and things, and you might see a, a GM94 uh, being used right now. Thanks for watching everyone, as always. Um, don't forget to do the obvious YouTube things, liking, subscribing, that sort of thing. And of course we have our social media accounts you can check out, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And our website as well for any events that might be coming up later in the year. And of course, of course, our three sites. Please do come and visit us if you can, if you live in the UK or if you are visiting. Uh, they are well worth a visit. Thanks a lot, see you next time.